Uh, talk us through these numbers, because you've highlighted them. Uh, hardly anybody else is highlighting them, certainly not being highlighted on the mainstream media, but there's some serious questions to ask, aren't there? Yeah, good morning, Richard. Um, just first explain what kind of excess deaths are. What you can do, Richard, is you can look at how many deaths are we seeing registered across each of the different weeks of 2022. We also looked at it through the pandemic as well, and then compare that to the numbers that we saw before the pandemic, so 2015 to 2019, to see if we're seeing more deaths than what you would expect. Now, we are seeing more deaths than what you would expect across the country at the moment. Part of that, though, is explained by the fact that we've got kind of an ageing population. So we've got more older people now in 2022 on average across the population than what we had in the years 2015 to 2019. A big cohort of people born kind of after the Second World War are starting to hit that 75, 76 age group. But if you control for that, take all of that out, look at the actual chance of dying in each of the different age groups before the pandemic, apply that to the current age pop group of the population, Rich. We are seeing this excess. So we've probably got about since week 19 of this year, about 8,000 more deaths than we would expect. The most recent week that we've had, which is the data up to the middle of August, over 1,000 deaths more than what you would expect. And this comes at a time when we've seen excessive pressures on A&E services. We've had a few heat waves in some of those weeks. It'll explain a little part of it, not nowhere near you know the full ex extent of this, because this is more or less every single week through it. And you're right. Every single day, Rich, we had for two years, the BBC, ITV, Sky, telling us how many people were dying within 28 days of a positive COVID test. I've seen very little, if at all, any coverage of these excess deaths, which are predominantly non-COVID. So just um, looking at that, and I think we've actually got a graph that we can put on the screen for people to see, uh, which is uh, looking at these numbers. Uh, there it is. And you can see, if you're watching this, that the, uh, the the orange columns above the white line shows the number of excesses, but you're talking about sort of a thousand people a week above the average, and what's really troubling about these, uh, Jamie, is the number of younger people below the age of about sixty. Is that right? Yeah. So remember, we have had a, a recent kind of wave of Omicron across the country, so BA four, BA five. And that explains some of the excess that we've seen in some of the older people. But if you take all the COVID deaths out of the statistics, Richard, and then you look at the different age groups since week 19, we're seeing higher than expected deaths across those age groups, 30 to 59. And then the Office for Health Disparities, they publish a little dashboard that looks at some of the, the causes of death that we've seen above expectation. And then we can start looking at those and we're seeing higher than expected deaths linked to heart disease, diabetes as well. We do know that diabetes check, uh, checks were kind of curtailed through the pandemic and we have had an NHS report itself a few months back highlighting that we saw more deaths than we would expect from diabetes and this does come at a time Rich where we've got uh, record numbers of patients in hospital who are waiting to be discharged but they can't be discharged because for factors such as none of care in the community people are perhaps going to A&E because they can't get GP appointments and we've got ambulances now stuck outside of hospitals Rich and we do know when ambulances are stuck outside hospitals and there's a delay in getting them into the hospital itself, that can increase the risk of mortality. So that in itself is, is sort of the, the shocking consequences of the, the just blockages all the way through the system where, you know, delays in getting an ambulance to help someone, which can take, you know, an hour or more as opposed to a matter of sort of 10 or 15 minutes. We, we keep hearing that. So... People could be dying early because they would have been, uh, you know, they would have been taken to hospital, uh, they would have been saved. People are dying there and then all the way through the system. I mean, this is, it's catastrophic, isn't it? Well, I think it shows kind of the, the silo mentality of the NHS because the GPs run their systems. If they kind of overstretch on not seeing patients, what, what happens is patients decide, well, I want to see somebody, you know, my health is important to me. I'll just rock up at the, the local A&E. So they do that. If you can't discharge patients at the back end because there's no care in the community, as an example there, what that means then is, Rich, you've got patients in A&E at the moment can't be transferred to the wider hospital. That means the ambulance turns up. And if the patient can't be then put into the main A&E, the ambulance can't leave the patient outside. The patient will stay on the ambulance. And what this means that is that you know, it's a matter of seconds that can save lives when it yes. comes to those Category 1 calls, you know, those emergency calls, those life-threatening calls. And they try and respond within about seven to eight minutes, but that's above average at the moment. So if you've got ambulances stuck outside, you have a heart attack or a stroke in the community, Rich. And then 
that ambulance turns up 30, 40, 50 seconds later than what it should do, those seconds can be the difference between life and death. And, and there seems to be a sort of deafening silence from the health secretary, the lead of the NHS about this. I mean, this is, you know, this is really significant. Uh, you know, during COVID, we had daily press conferences with the number of COVID deaths. But here we are, we've got huge numbers of excess deaths every single week. Silence. No, indeed. And, and you know, this should be talked about a lot more. This, you know, I haven't heard this come up once in any of the leadership hustings for the, to the Tory party as well, because, you know, ultimately, Rich, every life matters. It's not just the COVID deaths that we've seen through the pandemic, you know. And one of the things we've seen since March 2020, Rich, is that practically every single week since then, we've been seeing more deaths at home than what you would expect through the pandemic. So we'll be talking a little bit about the hospital pressures. There will be some more deaths going on of people who have stayed at home, protected the NHS, chose not to burden the actual system itself. And the consequence of that is probably been some people sadly dying at home because of it. And, and we're already seeing now, Rich, we had the, the NHS last couple of weeks saying, don't come forward this winter to the A&E unless you know, it's serious and you need to see somebody. People can't diagnose themselves at home. People need to be coming forward. I would say, you know, protect the NHS is one thing, but protect yourself is an important thing as well. You've got to see somebody if you've got a problem, I think, Rich. Absolutely right. And people should insist on it. And the whole point is the NHS is there to protect us. We're not there to protect the NHS.